As I'm sure many of you are aware, yesterday we had our highest number of cases since the beginning of the pandemic. And while some of these cases should have been reported as far back as November 21st, it's clear the virus is widespread and very active right now. So first of all, unfortunately this means our data does not support the return to school or recreational sports at this time but we'll continue to evaluate this each week. Dr. Levine will also offer more on what we believe is driving this uptick, as well as an update on the outbreaks in our long-term care facilities. But the bottom line is, we've got to pay attention to what's happening right before our eyes. So I'm once again urging Vermonters to follow our health guidance. It's the most practical, an impactful thing anyone can do right now so we can get a handle on this virus and keep it out of our nursing homes and away from the most vulnerable. Because as we're seeing, more and more of our friends and family members are being impacted, with too many finding themselves in the hospital battling this virus, and even worse, dying as a result. As a reminder, this means we all need to wear a mask, wash our hands a lot, and don't travel unless we really need to. And if you do, plan to quarantine when you get back. And also, what is probably the most difficult, but maybe the most important, is stop social gatherings with other households until we can slow down this widespread community transmission. Our monitors, all of you, have proven to be the best in the country in following the guidance and managing this virus. So I'm asking you to please come together for what we hope will be a final push and get us through this latest surge. The vaccine is right around the corner, but until it's here and in our hands and can be distributed to the frontline workers, the most vulnerable, and a big percentage of the population, the threat of the virus taking over is very real. And while we've done better than any other state, we're not invincible. As outbreaks in our long-term care facilities continues and case counts continue to rise, we continue to ramp up our surveillance testing as well as contact tracing. Secretary Smith will provide more details in a moment. But let me just say, we hope these are precautionary steps and won't be needed. Because contact tracing 300 cases every day will have serious ripple effects for the people of Vermont, our healthcare system, our schools, and our economy. Finally, I want to circle back to a question that was asked last Friday by Chris Roy of the Newport Daily Express about the toll this virus has had on our mental health. I know this has been among the most stressful events most of us have had to deal with, at least in my lifetime. And I see it each and every day. And it's much different than other crises we've experienced as a state. This isn't a 24-hour storm. It's been so prolonged, and we don't know when it will end. This forces us to be physically and emotionally separated from the people closest to us those we typically rely on during challenging times. So if you're feeling COVID fatigue, the loss of not being able to get together with others, or the anxiety and pressure of losing your job or having financial problems, you're not alone. These are reasonable, normal responses to a very abnormal event. One thing we can all do is reach out to our loved ones on the phone or video or even just an email or text. But it's more important than ever to make that extra effort to stay connected. Because even if you're not feeling some of these things, the person on the other end might be. And checking in can go a long way. I also want you to know there are resources available. If you or a loved one are struggling with mental health, or substance misuse, or anything else, you should reach out. There is no shame in seeking help, no matter how serious or insignificant you think the issue might be. 
Vermont ranks uh, first in the country when it comes to access to mental health care. That's because we have a dedicated community of mental health providers and physicians across the state ready to help. And if you don't know who your local community provider is or don't have a primary care doc, you can call 211 where we have people ready to help you and refer you to services. This is an incredibly uncertain time and it's okay to admit it's taking a toll on you. It'd be strange if it wasn't, but please know, help is there if you need it. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Squirrel who will now uh, add some flavor to this. Thank you, Governor. Good morning, everyone. As the governor noted, Vermont achieved the number one overall ranking for mental health access in the nation. This is something we should all be proud of. And like the governor, I want to acknowledge the incredible work and dedication of our community mental health agencies and healthcare partners. But most importantly, I want to take a moment to thank our direct care mental health workers who are truly the backbone of our mental health system and work courageously every day providing care to our most vulnerable Vermonters. Now more than ever as the pandemic stretches on, it's important to focus our attention on our mental health and wellness and to be checking on those that we care about. The perseverance and commitment of Vermonters during COVID-19 has not been without significant disruption, sacrifice and strain on our daily lives. Our routines have changed, we're juggling childcare and working, we're stressed in isolation, and we're worried about the future. And some of us have lost loved ones. We're all working hard and doing our best to continue to rise to meet the challenges and to keep each other safe. As Vermonters, we take pride in our strength and resilience, but the uncertainty and ambiguity that we are all facing makes it harder. Many of us are feeling additional stress and anxiety, sadness and depression. And many of us may be experiencing these feelings for the first time. What I can say, as the governor noted, is that these are all normal feelings and reactions given the circumstances that we're under. None of us are immune from the impacts of COVID and our overall wellness and well-being. We are all struggling in one way or another. And additionally, we know that the pandemic may be especially challenging for those who are already experiencing mental health challenges, who identify as psychiatric survivors, LGBTQ youth, minority populations, our frontline workers, first responders, and older Vermonters. It is also important to remember that mental health issues co-occur with substance use and developmental disabilities, and these are particularly vulnerable individuals. My message to Vermonters today is that you are not alone. It's okay to not feel okay right now. There are many valid reasons to be worried, overwhelmed, anxious, and exhausted. And if these feelings are beginning to impact you, seeking help can be very supportive. But I know that's not always easy. Unfortunately, there is still stigma around mental health. Many of us who would benefit from mental health services and supports and treatment simply don't access it because of fear of judgment and labeling. We need to break down the barriers of stigma. We need to talk about our mental health. I urge you, do not be afraid to talk about it and don't be afraid to ask for help. We have a broad range of services and supports that are free and confidential and available to Vermonters on a daily basis. One of them is COVID Support Vermont to help with the extraordinary impacts of the pandemic, the Department of Mental Health and Vermont Care Partners have launched COVID Support Vermont to help people cope with the pandemic. All the supports are confidential and free. They provide emotional support, a listening ear, and connection to community resources. Anyone can find this information and access the support simply by calling 211. There are specially trained counselors who are ready to take your call. To date, these counselors have responded to over 744 phone calls. You can also visit covidsupportvt.org to find information, wellness groups, tips, and advice. 
and also information about our 10 community mental health agencies across the state who provide mental health services and many are offering those services through telehealth. I also want to talk about suicide. While Vermont data continues to show a lower number of suicide in 2020 than the average of previous years, we know that Vermonters are struggling. The main message is that suicide is preventable. Research shows that interventions make a difference. Addressing mental health issues, accessing therapy and crisis lines are critical. To control the virus, it's all about testing and tracing. And for mental health and suicide prevention, it's all about outreach and screening. Remember that asking someone if they are thinking about suicide does not put the idea in their head. Instead, asking questions actually opens up the door for a caring conversation about how someone might be hurting and about how you can help. If you know someone or you are in need of support, you can also access the crisis text line by texting the letters VT to 741-741. You can get immediate counseling and support via text message. And if you or someone you care about is struggling with thoughts of suicide, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. And for our veterans, simply press 1 to access the Veterans Prevention Lifeline. We also know that as people experience stress, depression, and anxiety, they may use alcohol and drugs more. The Vermont Department of Health has established Vermont Health Link, a free and confidential referral service available to connect people to resources and substance use treatment. You can access VermontHelpLink.org or call 802-565-LINK. The data does show an increase in opioid-related fatalities compared to last year. With the isolation due to COVID, people may be using alone. People who use alone are at higher risk of dying from an overdose. People in recovery may also be at a higher risk. If you know someone in recovery, please reach out to them to see how they are doing during this very stressful and isolating time. Vermont HealthLink has resources for you, and many of the recovery centers are able to provide virtual support. And please avoid using alone if possible. If you are alone, connect to a trusted person by phone or text, or call Never Use Alone at 1-800-484 Three seven, three one. The governor noted pandemic fatigue. We're all feeling it. As a runner, I feel like I'm running a race and every 10 yards they move the finish line. The acute crisis has been replaced with chronic fatigue. We're tired of dealing with uncertainties without seeing an end in sight. And we're tired of Zoom calls with our families. Which is why, just like protecting our physical health right now, we should also be vigilant in taking care of and monitoring our mental health as we continue to manage the pandemic and move into the winter months. I urge Vermonters to make a wellness plan for your mental health and to watch out for one another. Social connection is key. Think about social connection and physical distance, not social distance. Sometimes a good old fashioned phone call is just the right antidote and we can always use text messaging and online video calls. It's important to create routines. We're all missing our daily routines and rituals. We need to exercise, get outside, eat healthy, and get enough sleep. If you have children, talk with them. Like you, their parents and caregivers, children may be fearful or simply missing their routines. Ask them about their concerns. Their answers will guide how you talk with them. And if as a parent, you're worried about your children's mental health, reach out to your pediatrician or local school. There are many school-based mental health services and supports available. And for any youth or young people who are listening today, let your parents and caregivers know how you're feeling. They want to help you, and they can better help you if they know what you're experiencing. If you feel like it might help to talk to someone, just say so. And we need to continue to address mental health needs. Depression is very common and very treatable. Know the common signs of depression, anger and irritability, loss of energy, loss of interest in daily activities. Look for the warning signs and seek help. 
reach out to support, helping others makes us feel better, and engage in your communities in a way that is possible and safe. Helping others helps counter stress. I've mentioned a few of the many resources that are available to Vermonters. These are free and confidential. Calling Vermont 211 to get connected to COVID Support VT, the Crisis Text Line, the National Prevention Lifeline, and Vermont Health Link. Vermont Health Link also has particular services and supports for healthcare professionals and frontline workers. And for those who identify as LGBTQ, call the Trevor Lifeline at 1-866-488-7368 or the Vermont Peer Support Line, which is open 24 hours a day and seven days a week, 1-833-888-2557. You can always contact your primary care provider, talk to a family member, a friend, a faith leader, a teacher, or a coach. And finally, if there is one thing that COVID has taught, has taught us, it's the importance of community and connection. The ability is us as individuals, families, and communities to be resilient, to continue to thrive in the face of adversity is now more important than ever. And as we stand together as Vermonters, with the finish line in sight, but still challenges ahead, we all need to take the time to ask ourselves, what am I doing to take care of my own mental health and wellness? How can I support my family, friends, and neighbors? And what will people say in the future about what we did today as Vermonters to take care of one another? Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Squirrel. I just want to take a, a brief moment today and follow up on more details uh, to things that I outlined last week in the area of testing and in the area of contact tracing. Uh, today, uh, there is scheduled a health alert going out to all Vermont healthcare providers and healthcare facilities. In addition, Dale will be sending out letters to long-term care uh, facilities and the Abbott Manufacturing Company will be sending out emails to all long-term care facilities regarding training of their Binex uh, Now cards as we move forward into a different phase of surveillance. In this health alert, a new surveillance testing strategy will be outlined for long-term care facilities. The following goes into effect on Monday. For assisted living and residential care facilities, we are implementing a twice weekly testing regimen for all staff using a PCR test. We will also make available antigen tests so that the facility can use them upon identification of symptomatic residents or staff. In addition, we are making available Binex Now cards, those are rapid antigen tests, to test staff daily at all skilled nursing facilities. In addition to daily antigen testing, implemented, we'll implement once weekly PCR testing for all staff. In addition, we are recommending using antigen tests immediately upon identification for a symptomatic patient or staff person. For now, um, the Vinex cards uh, the, the distribution is scheduled for early next week. And, uh, and as I said, all these communications will be going out to long-term care facilities uh, today. I did want to update you on contact tracing as we discussed on Tuesday. Uh, contact tracing is a critical tool, tool to mitigating and containing the spread of uh, COVID-19. We've worked hard to ensure that we're prepared to meet the rising uh, cases across Vermont. And as we see case counts continue to increase across the country and the state, we're bringing on more staff to assist in this effort. We are on track to uh, have approximately 100 FTEs by uh, December 7th. Additionally, and I just want to speak a little bit about this, we, we're looking at opportunity to expand our, uh, our call center and implementing a text notification to reach Vermonters with initial information 
uh, so that they can have a text to Vermonters alerting them to the fact they've been identified as a close contact and will help get the word out to impacted individuals as quickly as possible. Um, this is not equivalent to our current contact tracing efforts, but it is a first step in reaching out to individuals to alert them of possible exposure. We hope to have that system in place next week, probably around midweek. So I wanted to give an update on both of these uh, situations, both in terms of testing and long-term care. And Dr. Levine, in a minute, will tell, the, will give you the reasons why we're really focusing on long-term care. As you know, we've had uh, several outbreaks in long-term care facilities, and we think that more testing, more surveillance testing, is necessary at this time. I'll turn it over to uh, Secretary French. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, this week, uh, we're implementing the second phase of our COVID-19 surveillance testing for all school staff. Uh, each week through December, we'll be testing uh, approximately 25% of our schools each week uh, through the end of the month. So we'll, by the end of December, have tested all our schools again. Um, each week we're doing this, it'll contain a geographic sample of the schools statewide. Uh, this week, uh, we're testing Harwood, Franklin Northeast, Lamoille North, Lamoille South, Washington Central, North Country, Kingdom East, Essex North, Battenkill Valley, Bennington Rutland, Southwest Vermont, River Valley Technical Center, Springfield, and Windsor Central. We expect to test about 40 to 50% of all staff again in this round of testing. We have had some questions about why the testing rate is not higher. Um, both Dr. Levine and I have commented that we were very pleased with the uptake in the testing, uh, considering the rapidity in which we've deployed it. Um, but we've had some conversations with school administrators about this, and there seems to be a variety of reasons for why the rate is not higher. Uh, some staff um, did not feel that they need to be tested. Uh, others were concerned about the privacy of their health data. Uh, others found the testing locations not necessarily to be convenient, the registration process too challenging, or just the communications not clear enough. The biggest area of concern has been the registration process. Uh, some staff have had difficulty using the website, passwords changing, thinking they had registered but ended up not being registered and so forth. Um, so we've added additional IT support to this phase of the testing and we'll continue to adjust our procedures and communications to ensure that um, any school staff that desire to be tested can be tested. We have received a lot of feedback from school administrators regarding our, the implementation of our guidance on multi-household social gatherings, as we typically do. Uh, we're now pulling together that feedback and we'll be publishing um, frequently asked question documents or FAQ documents uh, to clarify some of those aspects. Uh, thought I'd give you an example of a, one of the more common questions we've received uh, pertains to um, to what extent groups are allowed for education and childcare uh, outside of school. Our response has been that we permit the, the gathering through what we call pre-established pods, um, if, as long as they're related to education and childcare. Pods related to social activity and informal playgroups are not allowed at this time, and we're discouraging the creation of new pods. We're also working with schools to communicate that this approach towards social gatherings is not just about Thanksgiving. Um, it likely will remain a concern throughout the holiday period, uh, and that could change, of course, if conditions change, but we want schools to be prepared to implement this uh, approach through the remaining holiday period. The availability of substitutes continues to be an issue in our schools. Uh, we formed a task force to take a look at this. Uh, that task force has members from the School Board Association, the Superintendent's Association, the Principals Association, Human Resource Professionals Association as well as representatives from various agencies inside of state government. Um, the task force met for the first time yesterday, and we had a preliminary conversation about possible causes of the substitute shortage um, and to start identifying possible solutions with a focus on uh, what, what the state could do to help more. My observation previously, I think, is still holding up that there's no easy solution to this issue. Um, you know, the issues relating to labor shortages existed prior to the COVID uh, emergency and certainly have been exacerbated because of it. 
Um, but there might not be easy solutions, but we're very interested in identifying creative ones. Uh, so we'll be following up um, internally in, the, in our state government team to, to sort of identify those options and uh, come forward with some recommendations. On a similar note, uh, we've had many school board members sign up to be substitute teachers. Uh, school board members are prohibited by the law to be regular employees of school districts, but there's a waiver process where they can be employees. Uh, and to date, we've approved 29 waivers for school board members to be substitute teachers. Uh, we really appreciate school board members stepping up uh, at this moment of need and really want to thank them for their service. And I, I put the larger message out to the member of the public. If you're interested in being a substitute teacher, I know your school district would really welcome your service at this moment. Um, you should stop by your supervisory union or contact your school uh, for more information. The schools are usually very accommodating in terms of um, what subjects you could substitute in or what schools. Uh, so I would encourage every Vermonter, if you have some time and interest, to, to help your schools out by stepping up to do that. Uh, looking ahead, uh, this period of school operations through New Year's uh, will require schools to focus on the safe operations of their, on a daily basis due to uh, the elevated case counts in the region and now in Vermont. After the holiday period and uh, with the implementation of vaccines, we'll begin to put additional focus on addressing the, the impact of this emergency on students and their families. The emergent national picture is indicating the students are feeling isolated and at a greater mental health risk on top of the already rising anxiety and mental health issues that existed prior to the COVID emergency. It will be important for schools to be work, working as part of their school district systems in order to address these issues particularly as we uh, begin to deploy additional state resources to support them in this work. A good analogy to understand how this might play out is our approach to setting up the surveillance testing. Uh, for testing, we ask districts to identify a single point of contact and we required a single point of delivery of the test kits. Districts then had some flexibility to further deploy the testing at the local school level based on an understanding of their needs and their specific logistical considerations. We will likely need to use a similar approach in organizing our education response and addressing the needs of students. We have existing structures and systems that schools can use, such as educational support teams, but we will be looking for greater emphasis on these systems at the district level instead of the school level, and then support districts with working with their schools. We are starting to see symptoms for our need to begin working more urgently on student support structures. These symptoms include truancy, attendance, and student engagement concerns. With remote and hybrid learning, truancy and the broader issues of student engagement have become more significant. And our pre-COVID systems are not necessarily the right tools since truancy in this context is no doubt the tip of the iceberg in terms of the larger societal and economic pressures that many families are feeling right now. We will also need to attend to the needs of teachers and other school staff who are experiencing significant fatigue at this point. We will need to identify strategies to support them in their work and dedicate adequate planning time for the schools to prepare for the next phase of our response. The next phase of our response will be more complex than normal school operations with a greater emphasis on supporting schools and looking broadly at the needs of students and staff. We will be coordinating with other state agencies and departments to support them in this work. We are starting the planning for this work now, but we expect to engage more directly with districts after the first of the year. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Secretary French, and good morning. Our website today shows 4,763 total cases since the start of the pandemic and um, 77 deaths, which I'll comment on a little later. As you already know, yesterday we reported a single day record high of 178 cases of COVID-19 in Vermont. Because of further additions from UVM Medical Center and other faxed reports that were reported late in the day yesterday that were backdated to December 2nd, this number has now increased to 224 cases. There are a total of 36 cases from UVM Medical Center in that number. Today we are reporting 73 cases. These include six more cases from a delay in reporting from UVM Medical Center, all cases stemming from the reporting delay 
are now included in our total ta case count. That would be 42 cases from UVM. The additional UVM cases are shown in gray, and the updated uh, total cases are, of course, in blue. New addition to this slide is the number in our new category of probable cases, which are very tiny in the gold at the bottom. I think you'll notice that there is a fair amount of volatility or liability in our case counts. At yesterday's press briefing regarding our uh, experience, I did note that um, one day did not make a trend. I will repeat that again today as we've now had a change in the counts and one day does not make a trend either. Uh, at the same time, when thinking about where these cases come from, we continue to have some of the similar concerns that I voiced yesterday regarding the fact that it is winter, people are congregating more together indoors in indoor settings. I'll speak about Thanksgiving in a second. You'll notice that um, our seven-day average percent positivity rate has crept up in the twos now. It had been for so long much lower than that, although on December 1st, it was 1.6%. And as we get towards these couple days that have just elapsed, that number should go down a small amount based on the number of tests and the number of positives. Keep in mind that we can't give you the up-to-the-date percent positivity because we need to have all of the test data in and reported comprehensively. I bring this slide up today with more importance because we are entering flu season. While we did have an uptick in COVID-like sy symptoms uh, earlier on, that seems to have settled down a little bit more recently. We now have uh, the CDC providing weekly assessments of flu symptoms in states, and we are now at the level that is regarded as sporadic. Sporadic is just what it says. We may have an occasional case here or there. It's not in every region of the state. It's certainly not widespread throughout the state. And that's pretty much how it's uh, appearing in the rest of the country as well. So at the present time, uh, we don't have to have undue concerns about influenza further complicating our situation with uh, COVID-19. But obviously, that's why we've been so front and center about urging vaccination early and making sure that we can do everything we can to prevent that. Now, people would like me to comment um, about Thanksgiving. And as I said at the press briefing yesterday, Thanksgiving was but a little over a week ago. And if you look at it as a holiday weekend, it's even a shorter time ago. We generally would start the clock ticking about seven days after Thanksgiving to see some impact. But clearly, the 10 to 14 day range would be uh, equally, if not more important. And we're not quite there yet in our time frame. Uh, and as I said, one day does not make a trend. Yesterday may have made people be very concerned that Thanksgiving's impact was hitting. The most recent number I gave you of 73 uh, would make you less concerned about that. Clearly, what we have learned so far um, is that there is not a major impact of holiday Thanksgiving gatherings in our current uh, interviews of cases and contact tracing. But we're sort of on that threshold, so I caution everyone to, to be patient. Hopefully not be patient looking for the worst, though. Be patient just waiting for the data. Because we have lots of reasons to believe Vermonters were uh, very compliant uh, with the executive order. Earlier this morning, we recognized 29 hospitalizations, seven suspected COVID hospitalizations, three patients in the ICU, and no patients on a ventilator. A number of the cases I've just reported were in long-term care facilities. And as we've promised, we're now going to present this data twice weekly um, at each of our press conferences. And here are the eight facilities that have had the uh, major outbreaks in the state. 
The majority of them are what we would call skilled nursing facilities. Some are uh, lesser acute levels of care. And as you can see, the numbers are quite uh, heterogeneous, but some of them are quite large. I'll also note, as the first slide noted, that there were two deaths yesterday, and both of those deaths were in a uh, skilled nursing facility. Our efforts to stem this tide are ongoing and threefold. First and foremost is to decrease the prevalence of virus in our communities, which of course is the reason for our continued emphasis on restricting travel, on making sure that if there was travel, that a quarantine period uh, follows that, and of course, focusing on restricting multi-household gatherings. Second part of the strategy is the promise of a vaccination strategy, which is uh, literally weeks away. We were heartened to see that both the Advisory Council on Immunization Practices and the CDC yesterday published consensus on the makeup of what Priority Group 1A should look like. And that, of course, includes healthcare workers and residents and staff of long-term care facilities. Those are actually in complete alignment with the decisions of our own advisory panel and our priorities in Vermont, supported by the data like you just saw on the last slide. And finally, as Secretary Smith discussed, an even more aggressive posture with regards to testing in our long-term care facilities to identify cases as early as possible and mitigate the impact of COVID-19 in these settings. As you heard, but just to repeat, for lower acuity assisted living and residential care facilities, twice weekly testing using PCR, antigen testing available for identification of a symptomatic resident or staff person. These recommendations are completely in line with everything we've been saying about PCR and antigen testing uh, all along. For the higher acuity skilled nursing facilities, daily antigen testing for the staff. In addition, having that available uh, to make sure that if someone becomes symptomatic, an antigen test can be performed quickly because it's likely to be a true positive if it comes back positive in that setting. And then finally, in addition to antigen testing on a daily basis, once weekly PCR testing for all staff. If antigen testing is not available, twice weekly PCR testing for all staff. So you've heard from uh, many times that we expect numbers to increase and yet I know it can still be jarring to see the kind of spike in cases we had yesterday. Many of us may be experiencing similar feelings right now, knowing the impact of being indoors more where the virus has more chance to spread easily, but hoping our efforts to avoid social gatherings and travel will help bring the spread down or even to a halt. As with Thanksgiving, the CDC is now asking Americans to avoid travel with the upcoming holidays, as cases, hospitalizations, and unfortunately deaths all continue to increase throughout the country. Quite rapidly, actually, to the point where yesterday, CDC Director Robert Redfield stated in his strongest language to date, we're heading into the most difficult time in all of public health history in the nation. So while we look forward to flattening the curve uh, in Vermont, Vermonters should take our current guidance and the CDC's advisory into account as they look ahead to the holidays. Staying home within our own households is the best way to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities right now. Having said that, though, I want to add to Commissioner Squirrel's comments the effects of this pandemic are truly waiting on us all, hitting us at different times in different ways. We may be overwhelmed by the news, constantly having to consider the risk of every aspect of our lives, wondering if that headache or that cold is something we need to worry about. I see the stress in my own staff who are working so hard and care so much about protecting Vermonters 
that it feels nearly impossible to stop sometimes, take a break, and take care of themselves. And I know they are not alone. From healthcare workers to grocery store employees to teachers, so many Vermonters have their own version of this. Then, of course, there are the economic stresses. And I would like to focus on something we haven't talked about this morning, food. Many Vermonters are at risk for food insecurity, struggling to find help feeding their families. Luckily, Vermont has resources available, including the Women's, Infants, and Children's Program, WIC, Three Squares Vermont, SNAP, and more. Newer programs, such as Farmers to Families, and Everyone Eats are helping to fill the gap. All these programs can help keep healthy food on the table. Healthy eating is important for all of us, especially during times of stress. So I encourage anyone who needs support to contact the Health Department, Hunger Free Vermont, or Vermont 211 for more information about some of the programs I've mentioned. Acknowledging that we are not alone in any of these struggles and that it's okay to not be okay right now is so important. And finally, Commissioner Squirrel talked about the need that's critical to overcome stigma around mental health. I also want to highlight stigma related to COVID-19. I've spoken a bit, a bit about this before, but as more and more Vermonters are getting COVID-19 or are exposed to the virus, we all need to make clear they will not be judged or blamed. Nor will facilities, schools, or businesses that may be associated with a case by no fault of their own. We cannot let fear, gossip, and negative attitudes harm our efforts to stop this virus from spreading. Stigma can lead to people actually hiding their symptoms or their illness and keeping them from seeking appropriate health care immediately. It can also lead to people not becoming forthcoming or fully honest with family, friends, or of course, our contact tracing workforce. So I want to reiterate, it is essential for Vermonters to follow our guidance to slow down the current surge. But if you do attend a social gathering or if you travel, we are not here to judge. What we care about is making sure we can stop the spread. That means helping us identify close contacts, notify them quickly, and make sure they get tested. If we fail to do these things, it will only allow the virus to spread more silently through our communities. Thank you again for your help. I cannot say enough that we are all truly in, in this together. Governor. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, we'll now open it up to questions. Um, just a reminder for everyone, we have 25 people in the queue. It's 1.50 now, so please be concise. Christina Gasper, WCAX. Hi, good morning. We're talking a lot about mental health today, um, but we're wondering, are there really enough providers to meet this huge demand? If people do take you, you guys up on your advice, we've heard from counselors that they're booked. We've heard from people trying to get counselors that they're having a difficult time, but specifically for kids, are there really enough providers? We've heard pediatricians that are saying they're having a hard time referring um, their kids to providers, and we've heard that very recently as well. Are you got, do you have some kind of uh, resources available to increase staffing or um, make these resources more available? Yeah, we're always concerned about having enough people uh, to help. Uh, this was pre-pandemic. Um, but we have put, taken steps uh, to implement, put people into place that we believe uh, can help in different ways, whether it's telehealth uh, or whether it's with 211 calling to, to that uh, venue. Uh, Commissioner Squirrel, do you want to add to that? It's a great question. Thank you. I think one of the, the opportunities within COVID that is presented to us is that we have really pushed ourselves into telemedicine quickly. Um, so one of the advantages is that we have been able to expand mental health supports because we have more telehealth services available and clinicians um, can work from home and provide those services more readily. 
The other initial information that we have, which is very interesting, um, and I think will bode well for the future of mental health support in Vermont, is that telehealth is actually preferred for many individuals. So we actually have individuals who might have been more reluctant to receive services before um, that are now coming forward. Uh, when we chatted with our 10 community mental health agencies across the state, um, over 40% of those people served um, have requested uh, telemedicine. I would also say um, to the good question that yes, demand has increased. Uh, we do have a workforce um, that is fatigued, uh, but I would say that our community mental health agencies, our private providers are really rising to the occasion. We've also been fortunate to have several federal grants coming into the state of Vermont that we've been able to, additional, uh, to leverage additional services and supports for Vermonters. Uh, yes, it's a mix of both. Um, so we've been able to utilize grant funds to actually bring more clinicians um, to provide support. Um, that's evidenced in COVID support Vermont. Um, we've also actually utilized our grant funds to do more mobile response. Um, we had a SAMHSA grant where we uh, provided services and supports to Vermonters more readily um, in a mobile outreach capacity, uh, which has also been successful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Governor, uh, and this is probably for Commissioner Harris, but uh, as we're getting closer to the end of the month here um, and our unemployment uh, uh, response, uh, where are we now as far as some of those cases that have needed to be adjudicated and, and you know, trying to get that stuff taken care of before we get going? And, yeah. and do before, you see anything? No before I refer to uh, Commissioner Harrington, uh, I'll reiterate, I'm very concerned uh, about the number of uh, those who are uh, on uh, utilizing unemployment assistance over the state of Vermont are in jeopardy uh, because of the federal a lack of federal action. Um, it's encouraging uh, to hear that they're uh, trying to come together as we speak, and hopefully they'll they'll clarify that uh, so that we can continue to offer uh, this assistance that is that is much needed uh, here in Vermont and in other states across the country as well. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, uh, can you comment on the uh, other appeal processes? Sure. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, I share in the governor's concern about the end of the month uh, and the ending of these uh, federal programs. Um, that being said, individuals who are either going through the appeals process or the adjudication process um, should not be concerned in terms of losing benefits as the way the system is set up is based on the week you are unemployed and the week you are filing for. So while these programs end as of the week ending December 26th, if you were filing for a week prior to December 26th, we're still able to make someone eligible for those weeks and issue payments for those weeks. Um, so just because somebody's going through an adjudication or an appeal um, does not mean that they will lose out on benefits as long as they're determined eligible for weeks that occurred prior to the end of the program. And uh, one final question. Uh, Santa's trying to get out there and find out what's going on uh, with the kids and what the wishes are and everything. Do you have any uh, guidelines for Santa and uh, uh, how he should go about getting his job done? Yeah, I think uh, just adhering to the guidance that we put into place uh, would be effective. Um, just making sure uh, that everyone's safe and socially, uh, physically distanced is going to be important. Uh, but we, uh, again, this is going to be an abnormal year, uh, not the typical holiday season. And uh, we just want everybody to be careful, be safe, and be aware uh, of, uh, of how this can affect us. Uh, individually and collectively and how we have an impact on that so just trying to get everybody to be safe so so perhaps oh I'm sorry go ahead anything you want to add to that uh, Commissioner Levine we're, we're going to have some more stuff on our website this week and we'll talk about that. okay yeah we'll be talking about the uh, the holiday season in particular uh, next week um, and uh, as we receive some of the data uh, as a result of uh, the Thanksgiving holiday. So that will impact what we do uh, in the future. But for right now, just everyone, just adhering to the simple basic guidelines that we put into place will be extremely helpful. So very much like the doctors with telehealth, maybe we should be doing telus, telesanta, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think they've been doing telesanta for quite a while now, so. 
Very good. Thank you. All right. We're going to move to the phones now. Uh, Andrew McKeever. Well, um, I believe my question is for uh, Dr. Levine. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, is there uh, a rapid PCR test that's available that gives results back uh, fairly quickly as in a few hours? Uh, just to give uh, some context, I, I was speaking to a friend uh, who said one of their employees had gotten a rapid uh, PCR test, a nasal swab, and the results came back within an hour or two as opposed to a couple of days. And I just wondered, uh, I guess, uh, is, is, does this test exist? And uh, if so, is it being widely used or, or, or supplies limited? Yeah, so rapid PCR, you may recall, I can't even think of how many months ago it was, where we had uh, a piece of equipment that the federal government had shipped to the states uh, that was going to do rapid PCR testing. And very shortly after they shipped it, more news came out about the performance characteristics of that platform, uh, discouraging most of us from wanting to use it, um, though it is still available. Um, so that's the only rapid PCR that I'm aware of that got uh, emergency use authorization. And the majority of PCRs are done uh, in a lab, so it does require shipping to the lab. Uh, and the goal now is really turnaround time from those labs and making sure that people can get a result in an actionable amount of time, meaning 24 to 48 hours uh, maximum would be the goal. Um, and that's why we've been very uh, meticulous about watching all of the labs that different healthcare providers throughout the state use, as well as what we use for our own state uh, samples and making sure that we adhere to those kinds of metrics. Uh, but I don't know of anything new on the market with regard to rapid PCR. And what's really the newest thing is rapid antigen tests. And I, I do have to you know, accept the fact you're saying rapid PCR for your friend, but the odds are heavily in favor of them having had a rapid antigen test. OK, I see. Thank you very much. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. Thanks for answering my question uh, from last week in such great detail. Um, this week I'm wondering, we, we keep hearing a lot about a vaccine. And when that readily becomes available, would that mean things will soon be turned back to normal? Or is it a little bit more complex than that? Yeah, I would say it's going to be a lot more uh, complex than that. Uh, Dr. Levine will elaborate, but uh, just think uh, about this. This hasn't been okayed yet, uh, even. Uh, I know that they're, they're seeking uh, emergency authorization as we speak. Uh, Pfizer, for instance, uh, I think it's the 10th uh, that they uh, will be determined whether they get authorization in Moderna uh, soon after. Um, but it's not as though uh, they've been continuing to create uh, the vaccine, the serum, uh, and have a great amount of it in, uh, in stockpile. Um, and that's the problem. Like when you consider uh, the number of people we have across the country uh, that are in need of the vaccination or in this vaccine serum, uh, we'll have to manufacture this, get it to the states, and then, uh, then uh, actually um, vaccinate people at that point. So this is, and then a second, uh, a second booster shot on top of the initial one uh, for these first two platforms. So this is going to take some time. This is going to take months. Um, so this isn't uh, instantaneous by any uh, measure. And uh, we have to get to a certain percentage uh, before we have that herd immunity uh, that uh, Dr. Levine has talked about before. So again, from my perspective, this is going to take many, many months before we get back to, to normal. Could be uh, up to you know, close to a year. But, um, but from my standpoint, the sooner we get at it, get at it the better. And uh, there is hope uh, in terms of having the vaccine in our hands uh, by the end of this month even for a limited number of people. And, and I'll keep my additional comments pretty short. Um, trying to have optimism prevail. Uh, most national experts are talking late April to May that we would have achieved this amount of uh, vaccination throughout the country. Those who are 
less optimistic, but still optimistic, are talking about late summer, early fall. So still a fair amount of a time frame, which is why we've been really emphasizing adhering to all of the things we do every day now is a must, even as people start to get vaccinated. Because when people start to get vaccinated, there's three groups of people. Those who have just been vaccinated, those who are still not in the highest priority group and are waiting for their priority group to come up uh, and imminently going to be vaccinated. And then the people who uh, are just not getting vaccinated till later in the phase. And all of that depends on how rapid the manufacture can be of the drugs, of the vaccines that are available. We do hope there will be more than two. And we hope that shortly after the turn of the new year, some of the other phase three studies will come to completion. They will also go through the same review process and authorization process and then be available. And as you know, through Operation Warp Speed, the government has invested in a number of these vaccine platforms so that there's already millions of doses manufactured waiting to be used if they get authorized. Sort of gambling on that, if you will. Um, but having said that, they're not millions of doses in a country of 360 million or something to that effect as still a drop in the bucket. So it has to gear up. But everybody's confident it will gear up and that there'll be enough vaccines that there'll be enough of them being produced that in aggregate we'll have enough to take care of the whole country. But we all have to practice masking and physical distancing and avoiding crowds for a pretty long period of time as we get into uh, the vaccinations uh, occurring. So, you know, into the spring for sure. Okay, thank you. Kat, WCAX. Hi, I too have been fielding a lot of questions this week from viewers who want to know more about the state vaccine rollout. They want to know how they're going to know when they're among the group that's allowed to get the shot. So, for instance, how will you be letting people know which group they'll fall under when they can get that vaccine? Um, so, for instance, do people need to show an ID that proves they're a frontline healthcare worker and just show up at a doctor's office, or do you reach out directly to all the different providers that you know are part of that and tell them, hey, all your workers can get one now? Like, kind of, how are the logistics going to work here? So the initial logistics are pretty easy because it's healthcare workers across the spectrum of healthcare workers and it's those who work or live in these long-term care facilities. And for the former group, um, we're working closely with the hospital community to deliver the vaccine to their employees. For the latter group, there's a federal partnership with pharmacies that um, is going to effectively deliver to those facilities on site. Then you move into uh, the next set of priority groupings, uh, which federally have not even been nationally uh, uh, announced, if you will, though there's plenty of background work that everybody's aware of that involves people who uh, are over age 65, people who are under age 65 or over 65 who have other conditions, chronic medical conditions, compromising conditions, etc. And then beyond that, you move into priority groups that involve um, public facing positions, whether that be a teacher, whether that be a grocery store worker, whether that be somebody else whose career is in transportation and they're driving a bus or what have you. Um, and that list can be very long. And then there's a whole bunch of other groups that I won't go into right now. Uh, so you're kind of saying, when does my turn come up and how do I know the vaccine is here? So for a lot of those groups, there are going to be um, involvement of the primary care community since we have such an effective um, vaccination program that they've all participated in already and uh, have a lot of the logistics taken care of. But we have a number of teams that are specifically looking at each of these phases, knowing that some of the people you've just talked about and that I've just talked about are not going to have any vaccine uh, on site here till January, February, March. We really can't say yet, uh, not knowing how many vaccines will be authorized. Um, 
there will be a lot of uh, legwork that will precede this, because your, your point is very well taken. Uh, we need to have the logistics, meaning how does the vaccine get to the person who's administering it to the patient? We need to have the communications underhand, meaning that everyone will know when their place is, is the timing is right for, for their group and their eligibility. And we need to have the information systems to make sure that people who get dose one of vaccine A know when to come back for dose two and are getting only vaccine A and not vaccine C. So all of that work is actually well underway. And uh, I don't want to get into the mechanics of it, you know, at this point in time, just want to reassure you that all of that has been taken under account. But it's going to be some time for some of these other groups, unfortunately. So people should be, bottom line, when people ask me this, should I just tell them that they should wait for communication from their doctor? Um, There'll be a lot more communication than just from their doctor, because there's going to be a lot of health department communication, a lot of uh, communication at sessions like this. Um, we'll, you know, we're, we'll be able to gear that up without much difficulty uh, through lots of media, because it's the way we communicate about most health issues. Uh, so I don't think that will be too unclear to people when it happens. Got it. Quick other question. If you already had COVID-19, are you still going to be asked to get the vaccine? Yeah, you know, we get asked that question all the time. So nobody knows how long after you've had COVID-19 your own immunity is, is lasting for, and is it durable or not? So the guidance right now, and this particularly impacts some of our nursing home residents, uh, because some of the nursing homes, you know, had outbreaks many months ago, and there are people who are still there that uh, might want to know also, do I get a vaccine or not? The best data right now is that we're going to universally vaccinate and not worry if someone has had COVID or not, uh, knowing that we want their immunity to be great for the future. And we're not sure beyond three or four months after a COVID episode, how good the immunity is. So the default is going to be vaccinate rather than question it. Thank you. Eric, Times Argus. Yes, this is Leslie for Secretary Smith. Any update on that email that was sent out to Barry Redman uh, mistakenly? Let me just uh, back up a little bit and uh, talk about what we've done. Obviously, as you, as you remember, there was a approximately 249 um, test results that uh, didn't make it to Broad in time. What we did was uh, telephone all those participants that were in that group and arranged testing, including a uh, including an additional uh, testing opportunity in Barry. I haven't got the update of, uh, we then, excuse me, we then uh, made sure that those testing results went to the state lab for a 24 hour turnaround. I expect today that that whole situation should be resolved in terms of those people who have uh, been given the opportunity to test, got tested, and will get their results uh, today. Um, or, or if they took the, if they took their last final um, opportunity for testing today, at least uh, by tomorrow. So those sort of situations ha have been corrected. As you know, we have corrected. There was a shipping label uh, issue. We have corrected that by using uh, courier service for now. We'll look at education as we move forward. In terms of the, um, the incident where we had uh, somebody um, communicate uh, via email trying to alert people that this situation had uh, happened and unfortunately made a mistake and, and put forward uh, other people's names, we're looking into that right now to see if in fact that is 
a violation of HIPAA. We have uh, my general counsel looking at that, and we'll do all the reporting mechanisms that we can uh, do in terms of any personnel related matters that will, if we find that there's a performance issue or anything along that line, that will go to the Department of Human Resources. But I, I want to generalize uh, some of the things here. We've done about 500,000 tests in this state. And there's no doubt that there was a mistake made on 249 tests. Um, in, in my knowledge, that was the first sort of general mistake that's been done in terms of the testing. And we've sort of resolved that as we move forward. I, I will say this, you know, there was some calls last week for people to be fired or people to be dismissed or people to be reprimanded. And maybe, maybe that happens. But I can tell you right now, a lot of people are working hard and working uh, under extreme conditions. And some people are just fatigued and mistakes are going to happen. They shouldn't and we should acknowledge them. We should correct them. I should take the blame for them, which I did ye uh, last week or this week. But we've got to remember that there's a lot of people right now that are humans and mistakes are made. And if, uh, if there's something that we need to do on a personnel issue, we'll take care of it. But, you know, I looked at the drop-down box that we, on the labeling mistake, and I gotta tell you, I may have made the same mistake. It was next day delivery, um, it was the label, but you had to drop down another box to do Saturday delivery on that. And we're, we're running, 24-7 for 10 months now, and people are fatigued, and they're running at rapid pace. And I think um, if they make a mistake, we can't ignore the mistake, we've got to acknowledge the mistake, we've got to fix the mistake, but we've got to remember humans make mistakes. What supports are available to state employees who might be feeling run down or burned out after months of going through this? Yeah, we have a variety of uh, employee assistance programs throughout the state. So uh, there are there's, there are various uh, programs within the state. I'll refer it to DHR, Eric, to get back to you on what those specific programs are. But there's ample. Um, reach out programs for, for those state employees. Eric, I can help you uh, get you that information as well. Okay, thank you. Lisa Rathke, EAP. Uh, thank you. My question for Dr. Levine. Um, I think today is the deadline for states to request the amount of doses of Pfizer that they would like. Um, how much has the state requested and do you expect to get that amount? We're kind of told the number of doses that we can request. So uh, it's not like, we really want more than 6,000 doses, you know, we maybe 60 or 600,000. Uh, so we don't actually get to request the number of doses. Uh, we're kind of told what to do and it's more a matter of us telling uh, where they're going and how we're going to utilize, utilize and allocate them. But yes, we, we know the timetable and we're hot on that, making sure that that gets in today. And do you know how much Vermont will be getting? Yes, it's uh, Five. something about 5,780. 5,850. Oh. 5,850, how's that? Which is half of the dose we're, which is half of the dose we're allowed to get because you have to reserve the exact same amount for the second dose for the people who get that as their first dose. And this is Pfizer only, right? And this is only Pfizer because it's the only one that's made it through the process until Moderna does or does not uh, shortly thereafter. Okay. And again, we're, 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 I shouldn't even say made it through the process because we're actually ordering vaccine that hasn't yet 
uh, received its emergency use authorization. That'll happen next week. Right. Right. Um, do you know how much of the Moderna vaccine from what will begin? Uh, I don't at this moment, no. Okay, thank you. Any of the uh, any of the informational uh, meetings that I've uh, attended virtually have indicated that it's all about supply. Whatever they have uh, in supply and inventory is going to be distributed uh, to the to the states uh, based on population. So everyone gets the same percentage uh, based on the supply they have uh, shipped to their states. So uh, I know as soon as they get. Uh, they get authorization and they're probably preempting that as we speak. Uh, they're, they're creating more, manufacturing more of the serum uh, to, uh, to have uh, to distribute on a weekly basis from that point on. So we should be receiving uh, at least uh, a few thousand every single week and hopefully stepped up after that. And as Dr. Levine had, uh, had said, hopefully uh, more manufacturers will get approved. Uh, so that we have uh, again more supply, more inventory uh, for each and each and every state. Okay, thank you, Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. The phone line on my side is breaking up a little bit. So I apologize. There's some interference there. I wanted to ask you about the forty million dollar shortfall on the education fund. Is it time to? I mean, it's, it's you know, there's a lot of uh, consumer taxes going into it now that's increased in recent times. There's the income sensitivity part. Uh, is, is it time to restructure how that is done and to either move it more or away from the property tax? Yeah, I mean, obviously, a couple of things. First, uh, we're spending an incredible amount of money for education, $1.8 billion. Um, and, uh, and that keeps increasing every year. So uh, we need to take a look at that. Uh, we're also always trying to distribute that uh, a little bit uh, uh, across the board uh, so that it isn't just affecting uh, property taxes, uh, other uh, areas of uh, sales tax and, and so forth, and uh, that, uh, that will help out as well. Um, so we'll have uh, some of these uh, conversations uh, in the upcoming legislative session. Um, but as well, we have to contemplate how much of the shortfall is due to the pandemic, uh, which there is uh, a significant amount due to the pandemic. So we need to reflect on that and what might be available uh, in the not too distant future that could be utilized to backfill uh, some of the shortfall. So uh, we've been through this uh, before. Our economy is a little healthier at the time, uh, and we were able to reduce the uh, uh, amount of uh, increase uh, to, I believe, uh, I, I don't believe we, we increased it at all in one, one period, but, uh, but uh, suffice it to say, we are all going to be working uh, to reduce that uh, so that there isn't any impact on, on property taxes. Well, the, 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 sort of the follow-up to that is that you know, the new normal economy is going to look different. A lot of those uh, sales and sales taxes are likely not going to look the same going forward for some time in those plans. And that's sort of what I was getting at. Is, is, are you going to look at the actual structure of how uh, you know, the revenue produces? Well, again, I think that uh, we did with the Wayfair decision uh, did contemplate that, and there is more money going into the Ed Fund as a result. So I think we we were ahead of that a bit. So I'm, I'm not sure. Um, that that part will change, but but again, any time we can distribute this a little bit further, uh, and uh, so that it isn't on one particular sector would be important. Okay, great, thank you. Stuart Ledbetter. Yeah, good morning. Um, I'm wondering if Dr. Levine could sort of help us understand what Burlington reported yesterday on the. Um, the spike in detectable COVID in the wastewater. And I mean, it was, you know, straight up. And I'm wondering what that um, foreshadows. Thanks, Stuart, for that question. Put it in context for everybody. 
wastewater sampling we've talked about here before, but if it's a new concept to you, it's basically looking at uh, the wastewater treatment plants and measuring uh, the genome of the virus in the wastewater. And doing that consistently through a season so you have a baseline level and know when there's going to be changes in that. Burlington's been doing it for quite a number of months now um, and basically found that I believe after Halloween saw a little bit of an uptick in that and now after Thanksgiving saw another uptick that was much more dramatic. Now these are not sick people, this is finding the COVID RNA in the wastewater. And I believe they found that across their three treatment plants, so it wasn't just localized to one part of the city or another. The correlation between finding the virus's RNA in the wastewater and finding actual human cases that are then tested with PCR testing because they are ill or just carry the virus is a challenging one to make. And that's where the science in this field is uh, really being contributed to by what Burlington is doing, to be honest, uh, and is growing every day. We didn't find uh, uh, a lot of correlation at some of the other times that there have been peaks and valleys in the data. This one looks so dramatic that we would expect to find some correlation. We won't know that for a number of days because the reason this is supposed to be a valuable modality is it precedes the actual illnesses in the population. So if you assume it precedes those illnesses by three days, five days, seven days, whatever interval you choose, and you want to use this for what it should be used for, you would say, I need to do something now that I've found this rise. And that's what Mayor Weinberger did. He basically, uh, I believe, had a press conference and he informed the population that this might be a good time to get some testing, especially if you've been in social gatherings and things of that sort, because it would be great to try to identify people early on, not only help from a public health standpoint understanding what's going on in the community, but help people as well so that they could isolate they could know if they needed to see a clinician. They could know if they could protect somebody else who might be more vulnerable than them in their community and prevent any increase in spread of a virus that might be uh, happening right then and there. So that's the intent of it. And I agree completely with uh, using the data in the way he's used it. And there is ample testing now in Shinton County um, and uh, he drew attention to the various places people can go for that testing. And we will see, hopefully, not that I want to trash the science, but hopefully we won't find a correlation between a lot of people uh, in Chittenden County or in Burlington specifically having uh, COVID just because the wastewater showed it. But this is part of the ongoing learning we do every day in COVID-19 in this pandemic. <clears throat> Okay, and just one question for, for the governor. I mean, you've been living this thing for nine plus months now. You've worried a lot about how the rest of Vermont is managing, and you talked about the emotional and mental health uh, struggles that many are going through. How are you doing? Yeah, well, I'm doing uh, as well as everybody else, I guess. Uh, these are trying times for each and every one of us. I'm, I'm uh, very blessed to have a, a good family, uh, as well as uh, a great uh, team uh, where we really are working on this seven days a week and, and trying to get through this. Uh, so we're, uh, I'm doing fine, um, and we're, uh, we're all working together, trying to support each other, and just trying to get through this. And, and I can see, again, I have some optimism uh, about the future, uh, what I see in terms of uh, light at the end of the tunnel, uh, with the vaccine coming into play, I think uh, is uh, is part of the answer. So we've been talking about this for quite some time, and now it's uh, becoming real. And so we'll, um, again, if we can see the finish line, uh, I'm uh, confident uh, we'll, we'll get there. 
uh, but we're all going to have to work together in order and help each other and support each other along the way. And so I've been uh, I've been fortunate to have that support. Mm. Well, thanks as always. Peter Hirschfeld. Commissioner Levine, I've been in touch with uh, the family member of a resident at Elderwood who tested positive for COVID-19, and they were told by a regional administrator um, that the resident would not be retested for 90 days um, because elderly patients uh, give off false results as they shed the virus. Are you familiar with this protocol and is it an appropriate one? So I'm presuming this is a person who tested negative and we're told that wouldn't get tested again for 90 days? No, they tested positive. Well, they tested positive? Okay. Yes. So there really is no need to retest them immediately. I assume they were tested with PCR, so we're pretty confident yes. they are true positive result in a setting where there's an epidemic going on. So. Um, I'm not sure where the cause for concern is because there really is no reason to test them again. They need to be treated for the next several months as someone who currently has COVID and had COVID um, and hope that they do very well, by the way. Uh, but by the same token, uh, that dictates where they will live in that facility, who will take care of them uh, because the, the guidance that our health uh, care facility outbreak prevention and response team would give them would be to try to cohort like with like so that uh, there's no chance of spreading the infection further to other parts of the facility that may not have the infection. For the individual themselves, um, we generally don't worry about their turning negative in the test um, because the fact is they have been COVID positive and they're going to continue to be COVID positive for some period of time. And there's a risk actually of them turning COVID negative and us assuming that there's no problem any longer. Uh, and that notion leads to the fact that people can have varying levels of the RNA in their nasal secretions after their illness. So sometimes they'll test negative sometimes they'll test positive and the best way to avoid that is to not test them at all uh, because it still won't influence how the facility regards them having had covid the 90 day thing uh, all i can think of that they're thinking of is the fact that we generally consider three months to be the interval before we worry about someone perhaps being able to get reinfected um, which has been reported in the literature, not, not a huge amount, but reinfection can occur after three months. So that's all I can think of as to why they were told that. Otherwise, I'm not really familiar with a protocol that would test you now, find you have it, and then say three months later, we're going to test you again. Thank you. Um, quick question for you, Governor, as well. You're encouraging people in crisis to reach out to the state for mental health counseling. Can you assure folks that uh, do take the initiative to do that, that uh, said counseling will be available to them promptly? Well, obviously, we hope so. And uh, if it isn't, uh, we want to hear from them uh, to make sure that we, uh, we uh, identify the areas that we need to have some shortcomings and we're, we um, are able to read to fortify that. But uh, again, I might ask Mr. Squirrel to answer that as well. Uh, thank you, great question. Uh, so we have, I guess, a continuum of crisis services uh, for Vermonters. As I mentioned, there is Vermont 211, which folks, we have dedicated clinicians who are there to answer those phones. Um, both the crisis text line and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you will absolutely get an individual um, who will talk with you and counsel you. 
We also have a robust network of community mental health agencies across the state. So when you call 211, if you need to be connected to a counselor um, or to receive therapeutic support, um, they will work very hard to connect you to the right individuals. And if there are any delays in you accessing care um, due to workforce issues or challenges, uh, we are certainly committed to working with Vermonters to ensure that they get the care that they need. Thank you all. Lisa Loomis. Hello. I have a question from a leader about why indoor youth programming such as gymnastics, ballet, and life hockey lessons are allowed, but other programs such as outdoor youth ski training are not allowed. Um, I wonder if um, Secretary Moore might be on the line. I am, uh, and we'll be having to answer that question, Governor. Uh, so private lessons and semi-private lessons actually fall under Section 8.1 of ACCB's Workspace Guidance, and that is what governs those particular types of activities. Um, there are expectations that participants will remain physically distant at all times. Excuse me. <clears throat> will remain physically distant at all times and um, facilities need to put in place systems to ensure um, there's no congregating during arrival or departure. And if all of those systems are in place, uh, those activities, as I said, are allowed to proceed under Section 8.1 of the Workspace Guidance. Does the guidance provide any workarounds for youth ski training, weekend race programs? It does not. So this is very this is specific to, to training, not competition. So to the extent it, um, it it needs to be private or semi-private. So really, individual skills and drills work would be allowed under this section. Um, but if there are no competitive events that should be taking place at this time, nor any types of programs, um, recreational or competitive, that uh, have large groups of people gathering to participate. To be clear, so gymnastics and ballet classes must be private or semi-private? Hello? I can hear you, Lisa. I'm not sure that uh, Secretary Moore... I'm sorry. I, <laughs> my apologies. I, I hit the mute button by accident. Um, the, the Ballet lessons or, or other such things would need to be conducted in a manner consistent with, with private or semi-private lessons at this point in time. Thank you. Courtney Kramer, Local 22, Local 44. A federal stimulus package we hear almost every day to push for more money especially as we're nearing the end of the year, some programs are set to expire and with the continued surge in cases. I'm wondering if you echo those sentiments and if you could talk about how this money would benefit for owners specifically. Yeah, as I've, uh, I've said numerous times over the last uh, few weeks, uh, an another additional stimulus package is uh, vitally needed to get us to the end of this throughout the vaccination period and so forth. Immediate concerns are, are, of course, unemployment, uh, and a lot of those unemployment benefits will run out by the end of the year, uh, as well as uh, some of the uh, the programs in terms of uh, of, of uh, food security. Um, so we want to, uh, we're hoping, uh, and uh, you know, again, uh, I'm getting a little bit more optimistic over the last few days, uh, seeing this bipartisan group getting together. Uh, in uh, in Congress uh, to try and come up with uh, some sort of compromise to get us at least a bridge, uh, some bridge funding to get us between now and uh, maybe further stimulus uh, when the uh, new administration is sworn into office. So um, I'm uh, again uh, optimistic, uh, but uh, but I'm still very very concerned, particularly with the unemployment uh, benefits that are. Are destined to move to uh, to run out by the end of the end of the month. Thank you. All right, um, it's about 25 minutes to one. We still have 12 people in the queue. Um, we're doing a great job, so let's keep it up. Um, Mike Donahue. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, a couple questions I plan to ask Captain Asso. I will 
go to one of the ones that have postponed a couple of times. Uh, it's now been more than 11 weeks since the state police at Isabel Seward, a 16 year old from Atlanta, Georgia, across the WLO line on Route 7 in Chittenden County and killed an elderly Vermont couple. Because <coughs> of a complaint by state attorney, Sarah George's office, the administration suspended a significant part of the Vermont State Police transparency policy that you helped draft. And the commissioner said he would ask for a, quote, swift and full, unquote, legal opinion from Attorney General P.J. Donovan back in September. It's been about three months, still no written decision from A.G. Donovan's office. Does A.G. Donovan and the state, are more lawyers needed in his office when expedited legal requests are needed from state agencies and departments? I mean, is there any COVID funds available for temporary hiring? I mean, and, and I guess the judiciary and others continue to follow the Constitution on that question. And uh, have you gotten any word when the prompt response will be provided to your public safety agency? Yeah, um, Mike, I have not been updated lately on that, and uh, and something that I should. Uh, but maybe uh, Commissioner Sherling, can you give us any update at this point in time? And and uh, again, it's a it's a reminder that I need to get back uh, involved in this one. Yes, uh, I can, Governor. Uh, thanks for following up, Mike. Um, as you indicated, we haven't received a, a, a written uh, response from the Attorney General's office. But notwithstanding that, our legal team has continued to work on this in between all of the other uh, enormous volumes of work related to COVID and everything else. So. Um, well, 11 weeks is, is definitely too long. It's, uh, it is uh, part and parcel of everything that's going on right now. Um, we are working on uh, updates to policy that flow from uh, the various uh, conflicting and overlapping statutes relative to juvenile records and hope to have something uh, finalized in the next, uh, in the next few weeks. But your former, your predecessor, Tom Anderson, the former U.S. attorney, has a legal opinion out there that clearly uh, answers that question. Uh, why has his opinion been discarded? Uh, uh, it, his opinion has not been discarded, Mike. His opinion was uh, on point to one specific case, not did not relate to the uh, various overlapping and conflicting statutory frameworks that exist. And, and just getting back to the question, is there COVID money, Governor, uh, available for temporary hiring? Uh, it seems like AG Donovan can't get things out for expedited requests. I mean, are you seeing this in other agencies, other state departments uh, asking for help, or is it just this is just yeah, okay, response I, I have. Uh, I I don't believe. I'm not sure that we've received a, a request uh, from the AG's office for more support, more attorneys uh, at this point in time. Obviously, uh, and throughout the government, in response to COVID, uh, there are a number area of areas where we do need uh, support. Uh, some of that, the most visible, probably was the Labor Department, and, and we were able to utilize. Uh, numerous uh, uh, employees to, from throughout the administration to help backfill, but we had to go outside of that uh, to get some help and to, to support uh, the Labor Department in particular. Um, I, might, I might ask uh, Secretary Young if she knows of any requests from the AG's office for more uh, attorney or more positions. Uh, thank you, Governor. I don't have it right in front of me, but uh, as part of the uh, hiring freeze that was instituted this spring, um, we are seeing, you know, every request from agencies and departments for additional resources. I do believe that there has been approval to the AG's office for positions that um, my members serve were related to the COVID response. But we can verify that for you, Mike, for the useful. Thank you all very Yeah, in terms of whether there's, uh, we, we don't have uh, a lot of COVID money left. Uh, we're trying to figure out as we speak uh, what, is, uh, what is currently uh, in the balance uh, in the bank uh, that we can utilize and distribute before the end of the month. Uh, but we've done pretty well in, in spending that allotment, knowing uh, that the 
uh, everything would have to be committed by 1231. So we've uh, we've done a pretty good job of that, and uh, so we'll uh, we'll see as we move forward uh, what uh, what the new stimulus package will look like. But but I don't know of any money that is available uh, that is not it has to be COVID related uh, in order to uh, to utilize for anything of uh, new hires. Okay. Well, I, I, yeah. If, if if you do check in with Donovan, that'd be great. This this secrecy thing is now spread to the Fish and Wildlife Department. And there was a case where some state-owned uh, property was destroyed, and Fish and Wildlife is now withholding information about that arrest uh, too. So uh, it is starting to spread. So any help you can do to ensure transparency would be appreciated. All right. Thank you, Mike. Aaron Patenko, BT Digger. Hi. Um, well, frankly, um, Mike Smith, uh, but maybe some other people, but provide an update on um, how organizations for the homeless are coping with the uh, possible escalation of funds at the end of this year, and if there's been, if there's been any progress on more permanent solutions to housing, you know, getting people out of hotels and hotels, um, getting people even out of shelters, the ones that are open, uh, and other, other uh, solutions like that. And thank you for the question, Aaron. As you know, we have um, significant numbers of people in our hotel motel program. Uh, that's because we want homeless uh, not congregating, not off, not, not on the streets uh, in this COVID environment. We've done this since the beginning of the pandemic. We're continuing um, in the second wave of the pandemic. Ultimately, we hope by July um, when things are hopefully when there are, when there is a vaccine by July, we'll start moving towards a more localized solution to bringing uh, people uh, into uh, permanent homes as well as uh, other facilities as in shelters and, and those sort of things. We are, as you know, we invested significant amounts of money um, through ACCD and, ho and their housing um, area and other areas in um, permanent housing and we continue to try to move especially families uh, try to move families into permanent housing but those things take a little bit of time to get up so i would i would presume through the winter months we're going to have a fairly significant amount of people maybe even over uh, 2,000 people into motels, hotels during the height of this second wave of the pandemic, and then start lighting, um, start moving people into permanent housing uh, towards uh, spring and uh, summer as we move forward. Um, are there any kind of concrete plans to fund that transition to hotels and hotels during the winter? Yeah, it, yeah, we, we, yeah. There will be funding. Obviously, um, we're using FEMA funding, and we'll use some general fund in order to do that. Okay, thank you, Greg, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. I think I have a question for you and one question for Dr. Levine. Uh, starting with you, Governor. Um, in your introduction, you talked about mental health and wellness. Um, and we've been hearing from a lot of veterans upset about the closure of DFWs in American regions. Um, we're being told that many of these veterans use these facilities to uh, help communicate with others uh, that are going through similar PTSD issues like they are. Um, and although uh, it's, a, it's an informal uh, mental health uh, environment for them, People have wondered, you know, why is it that they couldn't socially distance uh, and, and be spread out through multiple tables like restaurants in order to be able to stay open? Yeah, it, you know, again, with some of the uh, the clubs, uh, some of the activity in the clubs, um, that led to a number of, of cases, uh, and we saw that that 
social gathering uh, was one that wasn't really well uh, supervised in some respects. So um, they're amongst our vets. Uh, some of them are amongst our most vulnerable populations. We're trying to keep them healthy. I know this is difficult. We hope this is just temporary uh, and that we can open up these facilities just as soon as possible. But we're going to have to get through uh, this increase uh, in number of cases, the wave we're seeing that's coming at us. And, uh, and, and I, I think about this every day, and in particular, uh, those, uh, those veterans uh, that, uh, that are extremely important to me personally, but, uh, but as well as to us as a society. And uh, we're not trying to penalize anybody. Uh, we're trying to, uh, to help them, uh, protect them, um, so that we can open the doors again in the not too dear distant future. But uh, we just think it's necessary uh, to take this step at this point in time with the hopes again of uh, opening them back up, all the clubs back up uh, as soon as possible. Are you looking at any uh, changes in policy that would, that would allow partial opening or is it all or nothing in your view? Well, at this point in time, we don't want to complicate things. Uh, we, uh, we hope this is really a temporary in nature so that we don't have to uh, to take additional steps. So at this point, uh, and, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pay attention. Uh, we're, uh, we meet on this uh, almost on a daily basis in all sectors uh, to try and determine how long we have to do this, uh, what additional steps might be necessary, or what we can, uh, uh, what we can open back up. So um, it's not, uh, not as though it's uh, not on our radar. Uh, it's just that at, at this point in time, with the numbers we're seeing, particularly with the numbers that, that we saw yesterday, we're concerned. Uh, and, uh, and we just want to get through this this next wave. Thank you, Governor. And uh, one for Dr. Levine. Uh, we're hearing from people that are concerned that uh, as schools are doing much of their own contact tracing, they're being told to use a 48-hour period for, for uh, contact tracing. So uh, 48 hours before a positive test for those that aren't showing symptoms or 48 hours for uh, the previous to somebody showing symptoms. Uh, and, and that's essentially the period that, that is being worried about for spreading the virus within schools. So why is the state using 48 hour period and not a 14 day period that we hear about, especially for people who are testing positive that are asymptomatic? Thanks for bringing this up because uh, there's always a risk of oversimplification of something, which I think could confuse people. Um, if we're talking about an asymptomatic person, that's a very different situation because you don't actually know when they might or if they still are, have been infectious. When you're talking about somebody who goes to get a test because they're having symptoms and the test proves that they have COVID, you can pretty much know when their symptoms began and when they were in that 48-hour at-risk period of being able to transmit the virus to others but didn't know it because they felt completely well. So that's why we do work with schools very closely, but I don't want to just say schools, uh, businesses, you name it, work with them very closely and allow them to do some of that early upfront work when somebody uh, finds out from their doctor that they have a positive test and wants to do something to help others in their environment, we encourage that. But at the same time, we don't encourage it to exclude the contact tracing workforce. We want to do it in parallel and in concert with the contact tracing workforce. So the contact tracers will then make that assessment when they've heard the whole full story and be able to uh, help do the appropriate contact tracing and telephoning of individuals uh, knowing that the school did sort of the first phase of that, if you will. So we support both, but it's, uh, it's, it's more complex than just a pat rule that you can have and then everybody goes with that. We definitely want it to be uh, parallel, have the contact tracers and those in the schools or work sites uh, do their work. Does that make sense? Um. It does, but it, you answered something differently than what I was asking. Uh, it, it sounds to me like 
it, it's a 48 hour period before a positive test, especially for an asymptomatic person uh, that's being looked at as part of the contact and, and who they've been spreading to. But, but we've heard for months that it could, you could be spreading it for 14 days. So why is the state now looking back 14 days versus two days? Right, so again, in the symptomatic person, you can define the 48-hour period. In the asymptomatic person, you cannot. And that's how I answered the question. Okay, so, so the state's also doing it with asymptomatic people. And, and that's what I was specifically asking. Thank you. Olivia Lyons, WCAX. Hello. Um, I have a question for Secretary Friend. So earlier on, he said that the state is working on the district level to provide mental health services and using additional state resources. So I'm wondering what specifically are those resources? Yeah, thank you. I, this is my point. We're in the initial phases of planning that, uh, but we do expect to bring additional resources to bear. Uh, Commissioner Squirrel and her team and my team have been meeting fairly regularly uh, through this first part of the emergency in anticipation of this next phase. Uh, but certainly working with uh, the Department of Mental Health, uh, our designated service agencies, other departments in state government um, that are often represented in some of those more complex conversations. So. My point is we're, we're, we're starting to work on the plans that will make that interface with state resources more effective and efficient. Um, I want to use the word triage, but uh, we want to make sure that there's a systems approach to that available at the local level so that we can uh, be more impactful with student needs. So would this include bringing more counselors into the schools, or would this be more like setting up programs that teachers would be able to easily follow to students and give them the help they need? Yeah, I think it'll be some of all of the above. I think there'll be a delineation of sort of consistency from a state perspective of what those resources might look like, but then uh, allowing the locals to sort of figure out how to be the most responsive they can uh, based on their unique needs. Um, so it'll be a combination of both. I think also, um, you know, speaking of funding, you know, schools have received additional, you know, several pots of money, if you will, under uh, the coronavirus relief, the CRF funds, which we've talked about today. School districts also have the ESSER, which is the Elementary Secondary Education Relief Fund dollars. Those dollars have a longer tail to them, so the focus uh, with CRF funding in schools has been to basically use those funds to reopen schools and address issues like HVAC and some of the student meals programs. The ESSER funds, uh, school districts are just now starting to take a look at those, and I expect uh, those funds particularly will be used to this, address this next phase as we uh, focus in on um, re, re, you know, dealing with the impact of this emergency on students and their families. So my question is at the district level, would they be able to better allocate the funds to the schools that need it the most, or they're seeing the most issues of mental health occurring? Yeah, they, particularly when we look at the ESSER funds, districts have a lot more flexibility with those funds as compared to CRF as well. Our point is that we want to start doing that planning very intentionally, and part of it's going to be needing to assess what is the impact. Uh, certainly uh, right now, you know, looking at the resources we have and the resources in state government to make sure on a regional basis all districts are getting supported as they need uh, those supports. Um, but we, we have some planning still to do on this whole effort. But I think it's, it's really fair to say that's sort of the next phase of the work in front of us. We've known all along this phase was coming, um, and we have to start preparing to do that work. Just one final follow-up question to this. Do you have a date when you'd like to have this rollout? No, um, we started thinking about this actually uh, at the end of September when we made the transition from step two to step three. Uh, but clearly with the increased case count, we have to make an assessment about, you know, sort of the capacity inside the education system uh, to, to do planning while we're actively involved in the daily sort of safety uh, implementation requirements. So right now with the increased case count coming up, um, districts really, I think, need to focus on the sort of the safety operations um, and I think hopefully at some point I anticipate, uh, you know, optimistic, I'm optimistic as well if we can turn that corner and, and particularly with the advent of the vaccine that we'll have a little more capacity in the system uh, to start making that pivot. But we're working on the planning right now uh, at the state level. Thank you. Welcome. 
All right, just a quick time check. Five minutes to one, we still have uh, eight people in the queue, um, so please keep it brief. Greg Sakenik. Thank you. Uh, my questions, I believe, are for Commissioner Squirrel and for Dr. Levine. Um, the first question is with regards to um, Vermonters um, along our mental health theme of the day, um, in terms of um, uh, Vermonters reaching out for uh, mental health services and for counseling. Uh, I was wondering if there was an age a demographic of the, uh, of the population that, that, the, uh, that you're more, most concerned about. We heard a lot about, about uh, younger people, uh, students. was also wondering if, uh, particularly if you're hearing uh, about the needs of seniors, uh, many of whom might be isolated. Uh, might have already been isolated somewhat as before COVID, but certainly are more isolated now. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. And certainly when it comes to the mental health needs of our children and youth, that is a top priority. Even prior to COVID, we're all aware that particularly for adolescents, um, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey has already indicated that adolescents were at higher risk of anxiety and depression. Um, so that is certainly a group that we continue to focus on, um, which is why just the fundamental provision of our commitment to keep our public schools open um, is so essential so that those adolescents have structure and routine and access to services and supports. Um, related to our older Vermonters, that is also a priority population. Um, one of the things that we were able to utilize, we were able to pair CRF funds uh, with funding within our Department of Mental Health budget um, to actually expand our elder care clinician program across the state in partnership with the Department of Aging and Independent Living. Uh, so we have clinicians that are doing outreach in the communities, outreach specifically focused on our older Vermonters um, to ensure that they have access uh, to the mental health care and services that they need. Great, thank you. Uh, one quick follow-up question. Uh, there was a discussion about use of opioids and about, uh, uh, those, you know, about using alone and the danger of that. I'm wondering if, uh, what the findings are in terms of the use of alcohol and um, in terms of folks who are in recovery from alcohol and the difficulty they're having and, the, and if there's um, concern about the, uh, what appears to be increased use of alcohol uh, during this crisis. Yes, I think that is that be for you, Commissioner, or for Dr. Levine. Yeah, I can I can start. Um, certainly, it is of concern. Um, Vermonters increased um, use of alcohol um, and substances, uh, which is why the Vermont Department of Mental Health or Department of Health um, have advanced Vermont Health Link. Uh, we want to ensure that Vermonters who are under stress, who might be worried about their alcohol <coughs> consumption, um, can reach out. Uh, for support, and I will defer to Dr. Levine for any additional comments. Thank you. Um, I think we're awesome. Uh, Dr. Levine. Push for time. Yeah. Um, Austin Danforth, the Burlington Free Press. Hi. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, I think, a student for Governor Scott. Um, uh, Governor, I know you said earlier that you are going to continue to evaluate the status of uh, allowing sports each week. But I'm just curious, what sort of timeline are you and your administration envisioning right now to allow the return of recreational and uh, school-based sports? Is there a sense that this could realistically happen next week or two weeks, or is it further down the road? It, it really is uh, dependent on the, on the data uh, that we see. And we have to get through that two-week period after uh, Thanksgiving to, to evaluate that. So. Um, we'll know a lot more uh, a week from now, and uh, and we know again uh, that uh, time is short in some respects because uh, of the upcoming holiday, uh, the New Year, and so forth, and there will be a break in between. So uh, we're sensitive to that. So we're uh, we're looking at this, and uh, we'll continue to to evaluate the data and make a decision uh, hopefully next week, and and give you more information based on what we're seeing. It is is that data tracking in, a, in a, the right direction or is it still really too early to tell? Yeah, somewhat too early to tell. I mean, as uh, Dr. Levine had said, we had over you know 200 cases uh, yesterday uh, and uh, then we had 70 something today. So uh, it's hard to track, hard to d determine. Uh, and then we saw that, of course, that there was some 
um, uh, some uh, um, of the municipal sewage treatment plants in Burlington, uh, that we're see seeing uh, you know more activity, uh, so that 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 gives us a little bit of concern as well. So we're just uh, waiting to see uh, what's going to happen. We'll know again in the, in the next, I'd say, uh, week or less, uh, what direction we're going in, and uh, and if we can safely uh, reopen some of the uh, at least some of the practices uh, in terms of the uh, school sports. And just lastly, just to be completely clear, does this affect in any way UVM's plan to start winter sports competition on December 19th, or is that covered by a different set of uh, the guidance? Yeah, I believe that. Uh, APCD regulations. Yeah, I believe that's under a different set of guidance, but I'll ask uh, Secretary Moore uh, to comment on that. Yes, uh, thank you, Governor. College sports are, are subject to an entirely separate set of guidelines from recreational and school-based sports work. Great, thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Appreciate it. Joseph, Barton Chronicle. Hello, I have a question from an educator up here who notes that um, earlier in the school year, um, the Northeast Kingdom had very few cases of COVID and schools were, you know, by dint of hard work, able to quickly move to five day a week uh, in-person in instruction. Uh, as the amount of COVID uh, has increased even up here, um, it's getting harder to keep schools going that way, and um, people, you know, some schools are having to move to hybrid education. And this person wants to know, uh, given that we didn't need much of the way of support for uh, child care hardness early on, is there any provision that can be put in place now to help families that need child care and um, given that the CARES money will expire at the end of the year, um, is there any support for these hubs going beyond uh, the new year? Yeah, Secretary Smith. Joe, you raise a really good question that we're going to have to take a look at. Um, as you know, we didn't place a lot of hubs in the Northeast Kingdom at the time because um, you were going back five days a week. Um, the, the one thing that we're going to have to do, Joe, is to look at that and see what we can do in that area. In terms of ongoing funding, you know, we were in the process of starting to shut down these, uh, these hubs, and in many cases we did shut down these hubs in a lot of areas um, where they weren't needed anymore. So I think you raise a good question that we're just going to need to look at, and I'll keep you in the loop, Joe, on what, what we're doing. Okay. Um, since that answer is a little briefer than I expected, I've got another question, which is from another reader who um, has two children who go to different schools. Uh, one is quite young, one is older, both will con uh, schools contacted the parents uh, about both children having been uh, exposed to COVID. Um, they weren't approached by a public health contact tracer, um, but they did receive an email uh, from the Department of Health with general instructions. And this person who, you know, by now the time has expired, uh, was having a great deal of difficulty. Uh, his 10-year-old child was uh, staying isolated perfectly well. Her, his four-year-old was having a great deal of difficulty uh, isolating away from the family, and they only had one bathroom. And, um, I'm wondering whether he might have misconstrued the instructions and whether having a real contact tracer rather than an email speak with the family might have um, 
make this person's life easier and may make the life of other people easier if that's the direction things go in. Joe, for the sake of time, could you uh, get that information to me? Because I think it's probably going to all be in the details. Um, it sounds okay. a little it sounds a little atypical to have one form of contact, not another. And then I'm wondering if isolation was what was required versus quarantine, and how challenging that was, and if they were informed of the supports that are available which is normal part of the contact tracing operation. So if you could send that, we can actually uh, dig into it. Joe, I can help coordinate that. This is Ethan. OK, well, I will do that. Thank you. All right, last five uh, in the queue. Um, Guy Page. Governor, a man who ran for uh, a mom who ran for a Chittenden County State Senate seat reported on social media recently that when she and her children were at a laundromat, not masked because they had extensions, another patron who is an attorney threatened to report her to the Department of Children and Families. And I'm wondering, has DCF received complaints about unmasked parents and children? And if so, have you investigated and what has been the outcome? Secretary Smith. Guy, yeah, I have no knowledge of uh, any reports coming into DCF, but that doesn't mean that there hasn't been. Let me double check for you and get back to you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Levine, are there any breakthroughs on the apparent factual disagreement between uh, Department of Health and the Armisburg Church pastor? Any resolution of that? I think I gave the resolution at the last press conference. Uh, we, well, were, since then? we were aware of a positive case. We provided communication uh, so that the greater religious community could uh, benefit from that communication, but it wasn't provided uh, by the uh, House of Worship. And um, we put out our press release just so that the greater community could be aware that they might be at some risk if they had attended services. So um, we haven't actually been having a back and forth at all. Um, and I think that was the resolution. I've not heard anything since. We're satisfied from a public health standpoint that we tried to protect the public's health. Thank you. Angie McGregor. Uh, yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, quick follow-up question on sports for the governor. Uh, do you envision recreation and school-based sports resuming at the same time, or do you think that they might be stepped back at different times? Um, it could uh, possibly, yeah. Uh, Andrew, tough to answer uh, in some respects, but but they, it's a possibility uh, they could be separated. Okay. And then for Dr. Levine, um, a question from some folks uh, that, are, that would fall in the earlier phases of vaccination. Once you get vaccinated, can that individual's life return to normal? No masks, travel, wear a loud, uh, social gathering. Do they get the green light at that point? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the, the real answer is it depends first of all, how many doses they've gotten. And we'll assume since most of the vaccines are two dose, they would not be fully protected uh, after one dose. So they'd have to wait the requisite number of days for the second dose, which could be 21 days, could be 28 days. It's going to vary by vaccine. And then you have to allow the appropriate time for the body to mount the immune response so that you can measure antibodies and know that you're kind of fully prepared if you come in contact with the virus which most people are saying should be two to four weeks, and there'll probably be something more finite than just the range as we go along in time based on the results of the phase three studies. So we're talking from the day you got your first dose, still probably a couple months before you would consider yourself to be uh, ready to face the world, so to speak, without the protection of everything. Having said that, the Pfizer CEO just recently uh, acknowledged that one thing 
that he was not aware of yet from the trials is can you still be infectious to others even though you've gotten the vaccine? So that question is yet unanswered, which means I can't fully answer your question either. Um, but I, I've been preaching to everyone in the state that from the day one the vaccine arrives in the state, we are all still on the parallel paths of increasing the number of Vermonters getting the vaccine, but the same number of Vermonters doing masking and physical distancing and all the other guidance we give. So uh, grandparents uh, get through those six to eight weeks, it's not necessarily uh, a green light to, to start um, spending meaningful close contact time with grandkids. Uh, that would be the, not to our current knowledge. Yeah, that, that would be the message now, knowing it's subject to change as we get the results of all the phase three studies. Okay, thank you. Tom Ayers, the Vermont Standard. Tom, press star six to unmute. Okay, we're gonna move to Steve Merrill. You? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Great, thanks. Um, I guess this one's for uh, Dr. Levine. Uh, when you mentioned, I, I'd asked you before about the PCR cycles. Um, is, do we have a, when we send the stuff out to uh, state labs, do we have a, uh, a, cycle, a cycle threshold? I guess even Dr. Fauci is recommending in the 30 to 35 range because uh, I guess if you get uh, up to 40, you might be like catching minnows and reporting them as whales. Yeah, I, 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 get, I get your gist, Steve. Um, for the public, the higher the cycle threshold, uh, it means it took longer to find the virus, implying perhaps that the person had less of an infectious dose of virus. Uh, so the lower the cycle threshold, uh, the more concerned one would be. Um, so every lab that uh, is involved in doing assays for the state of Vermont population at large uh, has its own platform and its own cycle thresholds. Um, I will find out what we know about the cycle thresholds of the major labs that we're using uh, so I can report that back, if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I really appreciate it. And. Uh... Uh, I had a, a, another one, a quick one, if I may. The, uh, 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 we, I have a friend who has a, a scanner, and, uh, and I'm not sure how they do this, but uh, it came over the scanner that they went to pick up uh, someone who had trouble breathing. And I don't know if they did a rapid antigen test or whatever to like protect the first responders, but uh, it came over the scanner that is the person's age, where they were, and uh, that they were uh, uh, positive for the for the virus. Um, do they? Uh, how how would they know that before uh, before they go to pick uh, pick someone up? It's a great question. There are now home antigen tests. Uh, we don't think they've been available in Vermont yet, but there are just come on the market, home antigen test, where you can get a rapid result. Or the person could have actually been to a place, got a test result, whether it was a home, whether it was a uh, commercial antigen test or a PCR test, but not been very sick. But the reason for the phone call was they suddenly got much more symptomatic. So they already knew they had COVID and uh, were needing to be transported to a uh, medical facility. That's all I can think about. The good news is, no matter which scenario we choose, the EMS staff are well uh, versed in PPE, well supplied in PPE, and wouldn't dare make the call without PPE. So uh, I think the right outcome would occur for both the person and the uh, frontline provider. Well, oh, yeah, obviously we want to protect our first responders. 
Uh, and recently, there's a working paper that just came out by the National uh, Bureau of Economic Research. I uh, found that 91% of the major media outlets, uh, the uh, reporting on the virus was negative in tone versus 54% uh, by non-U.S. Uh, media outlets and 65% in scientific journals. Uh, the title of it was called, uh, Why is all COVID-19 news bad news? Uh, I, I know that uh, sensationalism sells, but uh, I, I, with this kind of reporting, don't we risk like scaring people unnecessarily? I, I mean, we all should be protected, but still, that's a pretty high level, don't you think? Yeah, uh, Dr. Levine has retreated, um, leaving me here to answer the question. So, um, well, that's great. I, yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, we're we're pretty. Um, I, I guess uh, we're pretty fortunate here in Vermont. I think that the media uh, represents uh, the information that we've been able to provide uh, in a in a very. Uh, strategic way uh, in trying to get the message out to Vermonters and having these press conferences uh, two times, uh, what used to be three times a, a week, uh, was helpful in trying to provide transparency. So I don't, you know, they, there may be other states that are outliers, but here in Vermont, uh, I can say that I, I think they portrayed the information that we've received uh, quite well and, uh, and, and honestly. So that's all we can ask for. Uh, we want people to pay attention. Uh, it may not be good news. It hasn't been all good news, and and that's uh, that's what we need to, to get across. Now uh, we see a little bit of hope at the end of the of the tunnel, and uh, with the with the uh, vaccines uh, coming into play, um, we're hoping uh, that this uh, this will provide relief and that we can get back to normal. So again, here in Vermont, uh, I don't think we've seen that negativity uh, that uh, that maybe was used for some of the information. For the article. Yeah, well, we appreciate the press conferences, and uh, and uh, I'll uh, go get my yappy dogs in from outside. So <laughs> okay, good luck with that. Interrupt them. Uh, thank you all very much. Yeah. Derek, seven days. Yeah, hi. Um, based on what you know about uh, vaccine supply, uh, do you have any idea when the state will be able to reach? Uh, residents of long-term care homes with vaccines, and um, and is the plan still to have private pharmacies administering this? Yeah, that's the long care homes? Yeah, so you know, till the end of December, and don't, don't pin these numbers down because, the, like I say, they change every day. We're anticipating in the range of 20,000 uh, doses coming into the state, a portion of which has already been pre-allocated to the long-term care facilities. So uh, the best case scenario, the doses will come in before New Year's or around that time. Uh, it all depends again on the federal timing. The second part is that the federal uh, alliance with pharmacies um, we are taking advantage of. All of the uh, highest acuity facilities are already signed on to that. So we're very enthusiastic about the fact that they'll be getting the vaccine and be able to deploy it to the staff and residents uh, fairly early on. I would say that you know process of them actually getting it into the arms of residents in the best case scenario would be around Christmas time, um, to be accurate. Uh, but that would be great. You know, that would be another piece of good news. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again on Tuesday. Sorry.